Hi, and welcome again to my Physics Online Video Lecture Supplement Series. Today's video is a continuation of the lecture on dynamics and forces and motion for the General Physics 1 class. And specifically, it is the second part of this lecture set, which will consider different examples of forces, um, by which I mean essentially different uh, types of sources that you will encounter. Now this is not to say that I'm going to be lecturing this time entirely on different fundamental sources of nature, but on different kinds of forces that you might encounter, such as the force of gravity, which is in fact a fundamental force of nature, but also things like the normal force and the force of friction, which are not fundamental forces of nature and yet are important forces to consider in the sense that they are contact forces. So in the first part of this lecture, what we did was consider the laws of motion set forth by Newton. And so what we want to do today is consider a few different types of force, like gravity and the normal force that I mentioned, also tension, and um, we will even cover briefly in passing the four basic forces of nature. So let's get on with that. The first thing that I wanted to talk about is um, gravity. And in the first part of this lecture set, what we saw was that weight is the force of gravity which is acting upon an object. That is, uh, sometimes it's labeled as an FG, sometimes it's labeled as a lowercase w for weight. Um, so the force of gravity is equal to the weight of the object which um, near the surface of a planet is the mass of the object times the free fall acceleration um, at that point. So on Earth that becomes the mass of the object times 9.8 meters per second squared approximately. Um, on the moon it's about a sixth of that and so on. Um, gravity is one of the fundamental forces of nature and it is a very pervasive force. It is a field force, uh, which means that I don't have to be touching an object in order for me to be applying a gravitational force on the object or vice versa. If you are near to the surface of a planet, then the planet is the main gravitational attractor. And so that is this weight equals mass times free fall acceleration equation. Of course, if you get farther out from the planet, or if you want to consider the force of gravity between two other objects, like, for example, yourself and the chair that you're sitting on, or what have you, then you have to use something like Newton's law of general gravitation. Um, before going on to the next force, it's worth um, considering uh, it, it, as an introduction to this next force, why is it that things don't fall through each other? Why is it that solid objects can't pass through each other? And one analogy to think about this is to think about two galaxies as shown actually in this image. You can see two galaxies sort of colliding with each other. Uh, one maybe is moving in this direction and one maybe is moving in this direction and you can see that they have sort of collided. And these two galaxies may or may not end up surviving as distinct entities. Of course, during any collision of this sort, there tends to be some exchanges of matter. Um, they may be ripped apart a little bit. Uh, one galaxy may be sort of absorbed by the other. Uh, may be partially absorbed with some star clusters moving off. But what tends not to happen is that during a collision of this sort, you don't see all the different planets and stars and whatnot in the galaxy crashing into each other and um, sort of destroying each other. Uh, and the reason why this is is because there's a lot of, well, space in space. That is, there's a lot of distance between, for example, uh, our sun and the next nearest star. In fact, there's many, many light years, well, maybe four and a half or 4.6, depending on how uh, precise you want to be, between our star and the nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri. Uh, 
So with all those light years distance between the two uh, nearest neighbor stars where we are, um, you can imagine that there's a lot of space in between the two that two stars could pass through. In other words, another star could pass midway between the two of ours, be two light years from ours and two light years from um, Proxima Centauri, and no collision would need to really occur. In fact, depending on the size of the star in question, we may or may not really notice it's passing from our vantage point on Earth, other than to see maybe a bright object in the sky if it's a particularly bright star. Um, in any case, the, the fact of the matter is that if you look at matter on a smaller scale than galaxies, the same kind of relationship actually holds up. There's a lot of space inside of a given atom, and there's also some space between two atoms in a given molecule and two molecules in a given crystal and so on. So given that there's so much space, and this is true even if you consider like a quantum model of the atom with uh, sort of smeared out electron probability orbital, why is it that, m that two solid objects don't just pass through each other? I mean, certainly you'd expect there to be maybe the occasional collision between one molecule and another, and, and in fact, in a crystalline solid, maybe you'd have a lot of collisions because of the spacing between molecules versus the molecule size. But you can't even really necessarily expect to send, say, an electron or even a single proton. Uh, that would pass easily through this entire crystalline structure, even though there are, in fact, gaps in the structure um, that are not uh, occupied at any given time by any actual s material. And so the answer has to do with basically the fact that there are fields that exist between charged particles, um, and that in itself is something that we will get into in a Physics 2 class, but we see the effects of this sort of in that two solid objects do not pass through each other, and to prevent that from happening, we posit a force called the normal force. And the normal force we usually represent by either an N or an F sub N. And what it does is it opposes motion of one solid object through another. And so it tends to oftentimes equal the weight of an object which is being supported by a flat surface. So for example, you see in this picture a table with a bag of dog food sitting on it. And the fact that the dog food is sitting on the table does not mean that it is weightless. In fact, if you were to go try to pick up the bag of dog food, you'd be able to lift it, obviously, but you would notice that it does, in fact, have some weight even before you have actually moved it off the table. And the what has to happen here is there has to be two forces acting on this uh, bag of dog food. Two, because you already have some force of gravity, the weight, and therefore you need to have an opposite force that is equal magnitude opposite direction to it to prevent it from accelerating downward. And that is the normal force from the table. So where does this name normal force come from? It's actually uh, the word normal essentially means perpendicular. So a normal force is a force that's perpendicular to the surface which is applying the normal force. So what it's doing is basically preventing one solid object from passing perpendicularly through another solid object. And in fact, it can also oppose any additional force that is applied to the surface via this solid object. In other words, if you p pile two more dogs, uh, dog chow bags on top of this one, what you will find is that the total weight of the stack has been increased by a factor of three, and so the normal force between the table and the first bag is also increased by a factor of three. 
and then there's a normal force between the second bag and the the first bag and between the third bag and the second bag. Note that the two objects are actually free to move parallel to each other, uh, barring, of course, the existence of the force of friction. So um, gravity is what actually causes weight, but there's another thing that can be thought of besides weight, and that's weightlessness. And it may be tempting to think that weightlessness is caused by a lack of gravity. And in fact, if you were to remove gravity from, um, a, from say, a space shuttle, you would remove the weight of the astronauts in that space shuttle, by and large. However, it's not the lack of gravity which necessarily produces the sensation of weightlessness. These astronauts actually are weightless, but they are not in a region where there's no gravity. They may be in a region where the gravity is slightly lighter, but it's not lighter by, say, a factor of 100. It's maybe lighter by a factor of 2, if that. And the, the, the reason why they are weightless, even though gravity maybe takes a 150 pound man and, and turns him into a 75 pound man and so on, um, is because the normal force between the astronauts and the airplane has been removed. And the way that they have done that is that the plane that they're in, and, and this is actually an aircraft, not a spacecraft, goes to very, very high altitude and then essentially goes into a dive. And that dive is an acceleration downward that's great enough so that it is essentially in free fall. And the result is that the astronauts who are under gravitational acceleration also in free fall, are now weightless, or apparently weightless, relative to the rest of the airplane. It means that there's no normal force between the astronauts and the bottom of the plane to hold them up. And so if they push off of the bottom, they can just float in the cabin. Of course, if they bump into one of the walls or another, then there will be some normal force um, between them and the walls. This is, incidentally, why you feel so much lighter or in some cases heavier when you're riding an elevator. When the elevator is going up and first begins to accelerate upward, you feel heavier. Then when it reaches the floor that you're going to stop on, it slows down very rapidly, you feel lighter. And similarly, if you go down in an elevator, you initially feel lighter when it accelerates downward. Then you return to your normal weight as it cruises. And then when it gets near to the floor that you're going to, it starts to accelerate upward and you feel heavier again. And in fact, if you were to take a scale and place it on the elevator and stand on the scale, you would see that the scale reading actually changes during these moments of acceleration upward and downward. So there's another thing that we should consider that has to do with normal forces and gravity, and that's what happens when we have an object on an inclined plane. And basically, the thing is this. Gravity always is going to act towards the center of the Earth or whatever other gravitational attractor is uh, producing the gravitational force. So that means that if you are on an inclined plane, like a hill or a slope or even a ramp, the force of gravity is not going to be perpendicular to the ground because the force of gravity is, again, down towards the center of the Earth. You can essentially draw it straight down. However, in the case of a ramp, the normal force has to still be perpendicular to the surface that is applying it. That means that the normal force and gravity are no longer parallel. And that in turn means that the normal force and gravity can no longer perfectly balance each other. In fact, it is impossible if two vectors are not anti-parallel, that means parallel but in the opposite directions, uh, it is impossible if they are not anti-parallel for the two vectors to actually add to zero. And that's true no matter what you multiply the two vectors by assuming that the factor is some scalar. So basically this means that gravity and the normal force 
add in two dimensions to form a non-zero third vector. So one way to basically uh, solve for objects on an inclined plane is to uh, rotate the x-axis by the angle of inclination. So instead of making the x-axis be horizontal and the y-axis be vertical, you can make the x-axis the uh, axis that's parallel to the plane and then the y-axis is the axis perpendicular to the plane. And what this does is it means that the normal force will act parallel to the y-axis. And then gravity is continuing to act in the towards the center of the earth direction is actually now a um, angle with respect to both axes. In fact, it will be at an angle theta with respect to the y-axis. Again, this is because we just rotated x and y by theta and gravity was originally in the y direction. If there is friction present, um, we will see later what friction does, it basically is going to oppose the motion of the object. Since the object is sliding along the x axis, the friction is going to have to be parallel to the x axis, either going up the ramp if the object is sliding down the ramp, or it'll be down the ramp if the object is being pushed up the ramp. And so basically, that means that the normal force and friction are both parallel to a particular axis but gravity is going to now need to be broken up into an x and a y component. So fg is mg. You can see the angle theta here. This is opposite the angle theta, which is um, equivalent to this vector. So this vector must be mg sine of theta. This right here is adjacent to theta, so it has to have a magnitude mg cosine theta, and if we want to include the direction, since this way is positive, it becomes negative mg cosine theta because it's down. So this actually lets us solve for a few things. Um, assuming no friction, it basically tells us that the object is going to slide down the ramp because there is a net force equal to mg sine theta that is in the direction parallel to the ramp and in the sort of downward direction. So this is down the ramp, this is up the ramp. The other thing it lets us do is determine the magnitude of the normal force because the normal force and this y component of gravity are opposed to each other. So the normal force is having to cancel out this part of gravity that's trying to pull the object through the ramp and so the magnitude of the normal force must be equal to mg cosine of theta. Okay, so now the next force that we want to talk about is tension. And tension is a force which acts along the length of a given medium. So in this diagram, the given medium is a rope, and tension acts along the rope. And it is a sort of restoring force. We'll learn about restoring forces in a little bit uh, in some more detail. What it basically means is that tension tries to prevent an object from stretching. And there's a sort of reverse tension that can be used to objects that are not ropes that prevents them from compressing. So if you were to push on both sides of this uh, weight, the weight would actually compress a little bit and there'd be a sort of outward force from the uh, weight's attempt to retain its rigid um, structure. But in any case, when we say tension, what we usually mean is a force inside of something like a rope or a string that is preventing the rope or string from stretching. And so it's sort of an inward facing force, if you will. On this end of the string, tension is up. On this part of the string, tension might be downward because this section of the string is trying to pull uh, is trying to be pulled apart and therefore the string internally is trying to pull itself together. If you pick any single segment within the string, your tension actually can be drawn with arrows in both directions, up and down, because every section is being pulled actually in both directions, up and down. 
The thing is that at the very end of the string, there is no next section of string to pull downward, and so you only have an upward force. And at the other end of the string, for example, where this hand is, there is no next section to pull upward, and so you only have a downward force. <clears throat> so tension, the, the way that you actually treat it within a problem depends upon your system in question. Um, if you are interested, for example, in the net force on this mass in the diagram, then you have a weight pulling downward and you have a force of tension pulling upward. There's no additional rope anywhere pulling downward on the mass. If you're interested in the hand, then you have a force of tension pulling downward on the hand. If you're interested in the entire system, hand plus weight, then tension is actually an internal force and therefore gets ignored for the motion of the hand and weight considered together. So what usually goes with tension is pulleys. And what pulleys tend to do is redirect the tension in a rope. And what that means is that they can change the direction of tension, but they tend not to change the magnitude of tension in a given rope. So the implication is that the pulley itself is going to experience a force from each rope that it redirects. And therefore, if you consider something like, for example, an Atwood's machine, in which you have two masses that have a rope running between them over a pulley, uh, which looks something like this, then there is some force of tension acting upward on mass two. It's actually also acting upward on mass one. Typically, one of these two masses is heavier than the other, and usually it's whichever mass starts off higher up because the point is that it falls and pulls the other mass up. So you'd have a net downward force here. In other words, this mass times free fall acceleration is greater than tension. A net upward force here, in other words, tension is greater than this mass times free fall acceleration. And this pulley is going to have a total force on it that's equal to essentially twice the tension in the rope. Which comes about because at this point right here on the rope, um, there is a force of tension essentially pulling downwards on this pulley. And at this point here on the rope, there is also a force of tension pulling downwards on the pulley. And so the net force looks like twice the tension. Down here, on the other hand, you have a force of tension upwards on this mass. You have a force of tension upwards on this mass. And you have um, a force of gravity. And you have a force of gravity on this one. Oftentimes, the pulley itself can be excluded from the analysis of a given problem. Uh, this is especially true if you have what's called an ideal pulley. An ideal pulley is massless and frictionless. Um, so what ends up mattering is the direction of the various forces that are acting within the problem. And this can often simplify the problem. With that said, sometimes an ideal pulley sort of modifies the amount of force that ends up being applied for a given uh, situation, case in point. If you have a pair of pulleys that looks something like this, then the end result is that you actually are able to reduce the amount of force that you're needing to pull on this rope by in order to lift this mass. So the net force downwards here is m times g. And so in order to lift it, you need to lift with a total force of m times g. Well, if you were to pull with a force of m times g on this rope, then that means that you have a force right here um, and a force right here, both equal to the total tension in the rope, which would be m times g. And so you'd actually have 2mg here, which is twice what you need to lift this with. So in order to hold this thing steady, you actually only need to pull with a force of t equals 1 half of m times g.
And this is true if you have a pair of ideal pulleys. That means massless and frictionless. If there's some friction and if there's some mass effects, then that will tend to change slightly what amount of tension you need to pull with in order to hold this object in place. Similarly, if you were to move this pulley over and this anchor point over so that the rope is not uh, making essentially a 90 degree angle here. In other words, if you were to set it up with an anchor point here so that the rope loops around like this and then comes up over another pulley over here and loops around like this, it's also going to change how much force you actually need to pull with. You then have to figure out the vertical and horizontal components of the tension in each of these two ropes. The next force of interest is actually friction. So at this point I've hit on gravity, at least gravity near the surface of the earth. Um, on the normal force, on weightlessness with the normal force, and on tension in a rope. Um, so the next very common force that you might encounter is friction. And what friction is, is that it is a force that resists local motion between two surfaces. So that actually also gives us the direction of friction. So if this crate is on this surface and this crate is attempting to slide this way with respect to this surface, then the force of friction will be in the opposite direction. So if motion is being attempted from left to right, friction will be uh, pulling from right to left between the two surfaces. Uh, note that it's not necessarily true to say that friction always prevents an object from accelerating, period. Because, for example, if this uh, blue surface represents a truck bed and the truck decides to accelerate in this direction, then inertia has the crate attempting to stay still, which would be an effective acceleration this way with respect to the truck bed means that the force of friction is in this direction, same direction that the truck is actually accelerating in, and actually the force of friction is what is in fact causing the box to move with the truck, assuming that there's no tailgate to apply a normal force. So what is the magnitude of friction actually determined by? There's actually a couple of factors um, three factors in the case of static friction, two in the case of kinetic friction. So there are in fact two types of friction. One is a friction that is present when the two surfaces are already moving with respect to each other. The other is uh, a type of friction that is present when the two are initially stationary with respect to each other. In any case the two big factors are what's called the normal force and the coefficient of friction. You've already met the, mo the uh, normal force previously, so I'm not going to say anything new about that here. Uh, the other effect is what's called the coefficient of friction, which is a constant value uh, essentially determined by how much the two surfaces tend to stick together. So how rough are the two surfaces with respect to each other and how much do they tend to have difficulty sliding across each other as a result. So about static and kinetic friction. If you have a static friction, uh, you have a force that is essentially trying to prevent two, move, two objects from moving across each other when they're already stationary. And so the total amount of static friction is going to increase or decrease to oppose any unbalanced force acting on one or the other object. Therefore, if we return to this crate on this um, flat surface, if I attempt to push on the crate with 10 newtons and the crate doesn't move, then it means that there is uh, a 10 newton frictional force resisting me. If I push with 20 newtons and the crate doesn't move, then there's 20 newtons of friction force resisting me. Um, I'm assuming, of course, that I'm pushing in the horizontal direction. What happens, though, if the object actually is already moving? Then you have what's called kinetic friction. And so the kinetic friction has a particular fixed value as opposed to the static friction, which does not. So static friction, uh, the magnitude of that force is less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. In the case of kinetic friction, uh, 
the kinetic friction actually is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. So again, if we return to that box uh, crate that's sitting on the surface, the uh, kinetic friction, if this thing is moving, if, if the coefficient of kinetic friction is, say, 0.1 and the normal force of the block is, say, uh, 10 newtons, then the kinetic friction will be exactly uh, 1 newton, no matter how uh, hard I'm pushing on this block. Uh, whereas with the static friction, if, if the static friction's coefficient is 0.2, let's say, uh, the maximum static friction would be 0.2 times 10 newtons or, or 2 newtons. But the actual force of uh, static friction could be less. It could be 1 newton if I'm only pushing on the crate with 1 newton. Or it could be 0.1 newton if I only push with 0.1 newton and so on. So in a sense, um, the static friction behaves similarly to the normal force in that it has a variable value because it's trying to oppose a motion. So recall that in the case of the normal force, if the object weighs 10 newtons and is on a flat surface and no other forces act on it, the normal force upward is 10 newtons. But if I lift upwards with 5 newtons force, it's not enough to pick the object up and therefore there's 5 newtons more weight than I'm lifting with, the normal force is now 5 newtons. Same thing is basically happening with uh, static friction. If I push with 1 newton and there are 2 newtons available for static friction, it will still only resist with 1 newton. In the case of kinetic friction, this is an equality, not a um, an inequality. The other thing worth saying about static versus kinetic friction is that the coefficient of static friction tends to be greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. That can be seen actually in a table like this one which shows a few common values for coefficients of static and kinetic friction. So case in point you can have stuff like uh, shoes on ice which have a relatively low uh, value of both static and kinetic friction. Um, oiled steel on steel also tends to be very slippery. Teflon on steel, very slippery. Compared to, say, rubber on dry concrete, and you can see the static friction here is more than the kinetic friction. Static is more than kinetic, and so on. So here is a simple illustration which attempts to show what is going on with static and with kinetic friction. So you have a trash can and um, you apply some force to the trash can and the trash can initially doesn't move because it can resist the force with some amount of static friction. Of course the normal force and the uh, weight are sort of balanced because it's on a flat level surface. Eventually your force of uh, that you're applying exceeds the static friction, the trash can starts moving and you switch over to kinetic friction which is lower than static friction. And you can see that basically in the form of a graph. This is showing the applied force versus the force of friction acting on the object. So in the static region the trash can is not moving. As you increase the force, the static friction increases linearly so that the two are equal. This happens until you exceed the maximum value of the static friction, which is basically that coefficient of friction times the normal force. And at that point in time, you have a very sh sharp drop off because the object is now moving. And so now you're in the kinetic friction regime. And so that kinetic friction is constant and it is the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. This brings me to the last of the actual forces that I wanted to talk about in today's lecture, which is the force that is applied by a spring. Springs are governed by what's called Hooke's Law, and basically a spring has what's called a restoring force, which means essentially that the force opposes attempts to stretch or compress the spring. So if you take a spring and you attempt to compress it by pushing upward, 
then it will have a downward force uh, trying to stretch the string back or spring back to its equilibrium position. If you pull down, then the spring applies an upward force to try and bring the spring back to its equilibrium position. And force is actually linear with displacement from equilibrium. That means if you have a graph that shows force versus displacement of equilibrium, this is the force that the spring is applying versus how much you've stretched or compressed it, you will find that it is linear. And the slope of that line is what's called the spring constant. And if you put all this together, you get what's called Hooke's law. The force of a spring is negative of the spring constant times the displacement. It's negative because it's a restoring force. It is a constant here times the displacement because these are linear with respect to each other. And that's all I wanted to say about springs for now. We will actually look at them again uh, later. Uh, but what I wanted to uh, talk about at this point is that forces and kinematics can be combined because forces through Newton's second law govern the acceleration of an object. And the acceleration is a term in kinematics. In fact, we went through a bunch of derivations earlier um, in class which show that the acceleration is related to the velocity and to the displacement through the time parameter. So you can basically combine force with acceleration to get uh, kinematics. And so there's actually a, a, an example down here that I will go ahead and work um, just for illustrative purposes. All right, so let's go ahead and work this example. Um, your car's tires are going to apply a force of a thousand newtons to the ground. What this actually represents is by Newton's third law how much force does the ground apply to the car. So F um, is equal to 1000 newtons and that's uh, basically Newton's third law. Um, so I'm going to abbreviate that as Newton's third uh, Newton's second law basically says that the sum of forces acting upon an object is the mass of the object times the acceleration. So I've written down here the two relevant parameters. Um, the total force, um, which is between the ground and the car, which is actually should maybe be abbreviated by something like F uh, total or F as I have written up here. The mass of the car is 500 kilograms and so we can solve for the acceleration because A should be F over M. And basically what this does is we can look and see do any of the other forces actually matter that are acting on this car? Because this is the ground to the car sort of in the forward direction. Um, so it might be helpful to draw what's called a free body diagram to represent this car. So here's the car. We have, by Newton's third law, this force of 1,000 Newtons forward. Um, we have the weight of the car, which is, um, we could call it F equals mg, is 500 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. So what that ends up giving us actually is 4,900 newtons. So 4,900 newtons. And we're going to go ahead and assume that the car is on flat level ground. So that means that the normal force is um, also 4,900 newtons. And so you can see that the normal force and the gravitational force cancel with each other. And so therefore, when we write that the acceleration is the force divided by the mass, 
we only really have to consider this force right here. So this is 1,000 newtons divided by 500 kilograms. And so the acceleration, therefore, is 2 um, meters per second squared. I never really specified which of these were significant figures. Um, so we'll just assume that there's one or two significant figures present here. Um, so we've got the acceleration. We want to know how far it's going to travel after five seconds. So distance traveled is one half of the acceleration times the time squared plus the initial speed times the time. And um, it's initially stopped. So we have one half of 2.0 meters per second squared times the time squared, which is five seconds. And so half times two is one. So you're left with 25 meters. So now we've got how far it's traveled. And last but not least, what's the final speed? So that should be the initial speed plus the acceleration times time. Again, this was zero. And so the final speed should be equal to the uh, acceleration, which is two meters per second squared. And that is times the time, which was five seconds. So multiply those two together with one significant figure, you end up with a final speed of 10 meters per second. So we've now solved this problem. Okay, last thing that I wanted to actually talk about in this lecture as such is the fundamental forces in nature, um, of which there are four known. Gravity we've talked about before is basically generated by masses. Um, it it uh, is actually sort of the weakest of these forces, but it ends up having a really great effect on large scale because it acts over distance, um, falls off like one over r squared, it turns out, and masses tend to add. But you can see that it's relatively very weak compared to everything else. There's electromagnetism, which is going to be actually the study, uh, the, the main focus of any Physics 2 course. Um, it actually is the second strongest. It can be attractive or repulsive. Gravity is only attractive that we know of. And it's generated by an acts upon charged particles. Um, in the case of magnetism, it is charged particles which are moving. In the case of electricity or the electrostatic force, it is in it acts just on particles with charge in general. And then the weak and strong nuclear forces basically happen in atomic nuclei. The strong nuclear force is actually what holds atomic nuclei together. It is the strongest of these forces, but it also has a very, very short range. It holds atomic nuclei to, together because otherwise you would have a lot of basically positively charged particles in the nucleus with no negatively charged particles. So the electro magnetic force between all those charged particles is repulsive. The strong nuclear force sort of balances that out to hold the atom together. And it, there is sort of a balancing act between number of protons and number of neutrons within the nucleus for it to be a stable atom. The weak nuclear force basically plays some interesting roles in particle decays. It's weaker than electromagnetic force or the strong nuclear force but is still considerably stronger than gravitation. So that basically ends the lecture itself. However, I'm going to go ahead and work a couple more examples for those interested parties. Um, you can, if you're taking this course from me, basically stop at this point. But if you want to see some examples, um, continue watching. So the first of the additional examples that I'm going to work is one in which we've placed a five kilogram block near the top of a frictionless ramp, which is shown here.
and we want to know what's the block's acceleration, both the magnitude and the direction, if the ramp is a 10 degree angle inclination. So usually the first thing that I like to do in solving these kinds of problems is to draw a free body diagram. Most people prefer to draw a free body diagram as I did the previous diagram, basically put a dot for the object and then draw forces on it. It may be just as easy though to put the dot here in the actual objects that we can orient the forces with respect to the ramp. Um, so what forces do we have? It's frictionless, so there's no friction force. Nobody's pulling or pushing on it. There is a gravitational force which is straight down. There is also a normal force which has to be perpendicular to the uh, ramp. And this gravitational force which is straight down must have a magnitude of m times g. And since we're going to do this on a ramp, it means that there must be some component to the gravitational force that is in the x direction and some which is in the y direction, fgy. And this component which is in the y direction and the normal force should in fact be equal. By the way, if you want to draw this same diagram independent of the ramp, you would basically draw it like this um, with a normal force here and a gravitational force here and optionally you can split the gravitational force up into the x and y components like so and like so and this right here by the way is angle theta as is this right here angle theta um, be that as it may we can write that the normal force and the y component of gravity must be equal in magnitude because this and this are essentially the same uh, force, FGY, FGY, and it's the only force that's parallel or anti-parallel to the normal force. And so if you put in the vectors like this, you get something like this. So if you do sum of forces, uh, all that you have left are basically FGX plus FGY plus normal force. Since these two are opposite and equal, they cancel. And by Newton's second law, the sum of forces must be the mass times the acceleration. And so what we end up with is FGX is equal to M times A. Well, looking at this diagram, you can see that FGX is itself going to be equal to FG, the uh, force of gravity, times the sine of the angle. So we end up with MG sine of theta is equal to m times a. And so you can see the two, the two masses cancel out. And so the acceleration must be g times the sine of theta. Or in other words, the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared times the sine of 10.0 degrees. And so what that ends up giving you, um, by the time you multiply everything together here, is that the acceleration is about 1.70 meters per second squared. And note that by showing that the masses cancel out, we actually answer the other part of this example's question. Namely, did we need to know the mass of the block to determine the answer to this question? So no, we didn't. Um, because the mass of the block ends up canceling out. So what does that imply about the relationship between mass and acceleration on an inclined plane? Well, it implies that the mass does not affect the acceleration on an inclined plane if, if the only thing you have is a single mass sliding down the plane. Now, this is different if, for example, there's a pulley on the end and a second mass attached that this one's having to pull up or vice versa.
but if you just have a single mass or even two masses linked together that are both on the same inclined plane, then the mass doesn't really affect the acceleration. And so that means that if you had a 10 kilogram block, it should slide down this plane with the same acceleration as if you have a five kilogram block and so on. And that acceleration is about 1.70 meters per second squared. So let's consider a slightly different example. We still have our inclined plane. It doesn't necessarily, um, it's, it's not necessarily going to be 10 degree angle, but instead what we want to know is, assuming that friction is present, um, what's the largest angle for which this block will still sit um, on the ramp without sliding down? And for that matter, what's the largest angle for which the uh, block will slide down the ramp with a constant velocity. It turns out that you solve both of those in the same way. So let's look at how you solve for that. Note that I haven't given any numbers here, so the implication is that that the mass should not matter here and the angle should be a function somehow of the coefficient of friction. So let's again start by drawing for ourselves a free body diagram for this mass that's sitting on the inclined plane. So again, you have a force of gravity, which is going to be straight downward. You again have a normal force, which is perpendicular to the plane. And now you have a coefficient of friction, and so now there is a force of friction, which is, in, in the case of a maximum force, equal to, and in the case of a static friction, is less than or equal to, the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Okay, so this force right here, this force of gravity, can still be broken up into an X component and into a Y component. Um, so that would look like this or something like this. There's a slightly better drawing of our Y component. And so once again, if we were to put together our force equation, we want this block to sit stationary. So we need to use Newton's first law. Um, and Newton's first law basically says that the sum of forces is equal to zero if the acceleration is equal to zero. So what are the sum of forces? Well, we've drawn them in red. The sum of forces is basically the normal force plus the gravitational force plus the friction force. So these have to add up to zero. And the blue breaks up the gravitational force. This right here basically says that the x components and the y components must add to zero. So Fnx plus Fgx plus Ffx is equal to zero in the x direction. And then similarly for the uh, y direction. Um, and Looking again at this drawing, we can immediately eliminate some forces here because the friction force is parallel to the plane. So that means that there is no Y component to the friction force, or in other words, the Y component is zero. And similarly, the X component of the normal force must also be zero. So what we end up with is that the normal force must be equal to the Y component of gravity. So Fn is equal to the Y component of gravity. Um, and that is equal to M times G times cosine of theta. And we can see that because here's the Y component of gravity and here is angle theta. So if we want to get this, and we have this as equal to m times g, 
then this must be m times g times cosine of theta. All right, so if we take that and look at this equation, um, f gx must similarly be um, equal to m times g times the sine of theta. That's for the same reason, using trigonometric arguments. And looking at this equation right here, you can see that fgx magnitude-wise must be equal to the force of friction. And this force of friction is um, equal to the f, uh, the force of friction in the x direction. Uh, so recall that the force of friction is basically less than or equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So we just solved for the normal force, so that would be mu times m times g times the sine of theta. Okay, so put this here. Oops, this should be cosine of theta. Um, in any case, put this in here and put this one right here in here, and what you end up getting is m times g times sine of theta is mu times m times g times cosine of theta. So I can see that the mass and the free fall acceleration cancel out of both sides of this equation. So that means that this equation does not depend, or the, the result does not depend upon the block's mass. It also does not depend upon whether the block is on the Earth or the Moon or uh, Jupiter or what have you, where the free fall acceleration is different. Uh, what we're left with is essentially mu times the cosine of theta is equal to the sine of theta. So if we divide both sides of this by the cosine of theta, what we end up getting is that mu is equal to the tangent of theta. Or in other words, the maximum angle for which this block will um, not slide down the ramp or the angle at which the block slides down the ramp at a constant velocity is given by the arc tangent of the coefficient of friction and that solves this problem. So now if we know what the coefficient of friction is we can solve for a numerical value of the angle theta. So that's all that I had planned for this lecture video. Um, if you basically suffered through to the end then congratulations and thanks for watching all of it. If you quit or skipped some of the exercises that's okay as well. The point of these videos is to be helpful to you not to be absolutely required watching. Um, the the one key that I highlighted in this video that wasn't an explicit point uh, is the drawing of a free body diagram. Uh, there's no particular slide that's dedicated to that, but it is a very useful skill in general in physics. It helps you set up problems to solve them. Beyond that, we talked about quite a variety of forces, um, including the four fundamental forces of nature, that is gravity, the electromagnetic force, the nuclear weak force, and the nuclear strong force. But we also talked about different types of forces that you might encounter um, that are contact forces, shall we say. Friction, or normal force, or tension, or, or um, the, the force that a spring has for its restoring force. So hopefully you found this uh, lecture part interesting, and thanks for watching.